Um, and then there's this, the barriers as well, um, that there are grade changes and walls and other things that have to be absorbed. And uh, bearing in mind that the, you know, the budget is it's certainly not a small budget, that's a lot of money uh, in the time, uh, particularly in the times that we live in now, but it's also over 20 acres of park that we're reworking. So uh, we've had to be creative and, and innovative about some of these approaches. Um, I think it's, I know there's probably a handful of things that can be said we all like to do uh, in parks. Uh, I think we all go there to see things, to see others, but especially to look out. Um, urban dwellers uh, live in smaller houses and apartments. Many of us live in high-rise buildings, and when we go into a park, we like to feel connected to the ground, but we like to feel the space. And one of the great things about this site is we have a lot of borrowed landscape. The borrowed landscape, of course, is to some degree Millennium Park, but especially Grant Park to the south and the lake um, to the east. And so getting people up uh, on higher ground where they can look out and borrow that visual landscape is an extremely important thing. Uh, these are just some pictures from the public meetings we had summer before last. Uh, they were orga organized around the idea of hearing basically what kinds of things um, you all uh, wanted to have the park do. Of course, um, there were consensus around some things, there were conflicts about others. We put out the idea of these different kind of general categories of things you could do, recognizing that a great park, and that's what we want to make here, puts together activities and uses that may at first viewing seem like they're in conflict with each other. How do you make passive areas and also have active areas for children? How do you make places that are protected out of the wind uh, or, or in sun pockets, in other words, down lower in the ground, and how do you make landscape that also creates those views that I was talking about a minute ago. So the first thing you have to do is to kind of sort all of those things out, like a shopping list, like you were going to the store, basically make a list of the things that you want to do. These are just reviewing the, the types quickly that we talked about. We call, one type we call the civic landscape. They, they can be pastoral, like this Prospect Park example uh, on uh, the left, or um, playgrounds like our water lab in Brooklyn Bridge Park on the right. Um, the boundless landscape tends to be places, of, uh, at least at times, that have lower levels of activity. They also, of course, could be places where large groups could gather temporarily. But boundless, or boundless refers to feeling like the park is bigger than it actually is, setting up the landscape in a way like on the left where you're looking up a hill and the hill kind of cuts off the, the horizon and you just see hill and sky and it feels really big. Or on the right um, where we see a lot of evergreen trees which is another big part of our programming for the park is to make winter and evergreens part of what we do. Um, you get that sense of boundlessness because it feels deep. Um, we definitely um, proposed and heard in the public process that people like the idea of bringing some nature or natural landscape back into the planning of North Grant Park. This is our Lake Whitney water treatment plan in New Haven on the left and the stone wall and teardrop park with a wall of ice uh, in the winter that becomes a wall of water in the summer. Um, we also recognize that there are parts in urban parks that have to have an urban feel about them. Uh, cafes, beer gardens, uh, and places for gathering and assembly where people can have uh, green markets and so on is very important. These are some of the basic principles. Uh, the beginning of the making of a shopping list that I talked about. Uh, we want to make a park that as many people like and use as possible and the way to do that is to accommodate as many different kinds of activities as is sensible on a 20-acre site. We're really focused on comfort, and especially comfort at the times of seasonal extreme. We all know what those are in Chicago. One of them is starting today. I came with the wrong clothes on. But it gets cold and windy in the winter, and it gets hot and steamy in the summer, and we have to make sure that it's a place you want to be in in both of those seasons. We recognize people are mostly going to be out there when it already feels good, fall and spring. 
and uh, but we have to try to stretch the use by focusing on comfort. A network of paths that are that are fun and interesting and connective and get you where you want to go, but also give you some of that mystery and sense of discovery. Um, and they have to be, as I said, accessible and welcoming. Um, I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, so uh, I know that there's a topographic difference between central Illinois and Chicago, but we really don't have a lot of topography in Chicago either. And one of the things we heard in the public meetings, heads were definitely shaking more in this direction than this when we said making hills um, and places to get up would be a good idea. So our scheme is built not crazy high hills, but using a kind of rolling topography to modulate the site and to make it um, distinctive. Um, we heard a lot about children. Um, we're a very children-focused uh, culture right now. We heard about grandparents living nearby. We heard about residents who don't live far apart who come down to use Millennium or to use North Grand Park and liked the idea of having more things for children to do, so that's a focus. And I guess as a recap, generally, just that we have an experiential range that we're creating. I think the most important thing about the park survey that the Chicago Park District did that many of you responded to is it was very clear that people wanted a strong, passive emphasis here. Um, people, um, I mean, most people were very um, appreciative and and laudatory about Millennium, but they, the, the main thing they said was, we don't need to repeat the things that Millennium gives us. We want things that complement. So if we're using Millennium and we go over the Gary Bridge, we want other things to do over there. We heard that in the public meetings, and then the questionnaires definitely backed up this notion of, of more passive things to do um, and things you don't have to spend money on. Um, we're going to do seasonal programming and design things to make um, winter interesting, but we're also setting this design, this park design up in a way that the way that art will be used in the landscape is more ephemeral, more temporary. We have the major, major and, and, and fabulous art in Millennium. We have fabulous art here too, but it's going to come and go away. Just like I said, we think of North Grand Park as the complement um, to the Millennium quality. So we have some very big and very expensive and permanent sculpture in Millennium. We're going to have things like work by, perhaps, it's not settled yet, um, Ormsley, um, the light, the projection of the um, eyeballs on the snow there, and a skate path and so forth that I'll talk about. There's got to be lots of things to do in the summer. We all need parks in the summer the most. Our apartments are hot, we're hot, the whole city is hot. So we're going to really put a big emphasis on summer and especially for the kids' water play. And then we put that all together. Remember I said it's like a shopping list. I know this isn't the way you would write down a shopping list if you were going to the grocery store. Um, but this is us taking the things that I've said and the things we learn from you and to beginning to just overlay those words as the beginning of then designing the park that will be in those areas. So with connection at the edges, we have lit woodland, we have gardens, we have gathering spaces and so on. In terms of climate mitigation, a comfort mitigation, one of the really big issues is noise. Uh, we get a lot of noise from both sides, but especially from Lake Shore and so one of the things that we're doing is contouring the land towards uh, Lake Shore so that those areas are high up. That gives you the advantage of being up high where you can see the view, but when you're down on the other side of that landscape, the earth, the weight of the earth, and the presence of the earth redi redirects the sound and makes the sound waves travel further and it makes it quieter on the inside. Um, and the other thing that wind and vegetation <laughs> do for us is they reduce, um, the other thing that <clears throat> vegetation and landform does is it reduces the wind. And so the edges are contoured with land and, and plantings, not too much so it's scary, but a lot of plantings to break the wind and create that shade in the summer. And then of course those hills that 
block the wind and block the noise, give you these places to get up and see that view to, Gr to Grant Park to the south and look out over the lake, which is uh, truly spectacular. This is not new to us in terms of the work of our firm. We're used to working with acousticians um, who scientifically help us predict what the sound level reduction will be. We'll be doing that. We've done that in other projects as well. I think one of the most important things about a park is that the paths make sense on the inside. And the challenge for us in our design is to strike the right balance between being sensible and yet being whimsical enough that it's a fun place to go to, that you're curving, you're bending, you have a sense of moving uh, through um, the landscape irregularly. I think that's, a, if, you, if you say what a passive landscape is, uh, it invites you to linger, and it doesn't put too many things that are going to be noisy or distracting everywhere so that there are places where you can kind of just enjoy the quiet of the park. So we're really working on accommodating the east-west routes. We're trying to create, and this is our first pass at it, we're trying to create a combination of kind of directly getting you there and yet, and yet creating those in a curving way that doesn't rush you and which complements the character of Grant Park, which is, of course, based more on a European model of geometry and straight paths. And, you know, there's really a long tradition in park making of parks having areas that are nearby that have different character. And that's what we're trying to do here. Um, I don't, I'm sure we're like most of you. We think Grant Park is one of the great parks in the world. And it's and over... It's over 100 years that Chicago has been working on this project to make this incredible waterfront. And this is the last piece of that. And we would like to give people who are using this park a sense of irregularity and some mystery in the design of the landscape that we create. So here, the red is the circulation paths, early schematic drawings. By the way, Scott has done a whole lot of this work. And Nuni, who's sitting in the foreground, you just wave your hand, Nuni. Um, Nuni Kim and Scott Street, who are working with Paul Sack, who's a senior associate in charge. But what you see coming together here is a combination of the lawn areas, which is the bright green, and the way those paths start to intersect. Now, the arrows, of course, eventually go all the way through. We're showing them as the, as the approach, and of course, they work as ways to leave the park as well. But you can see how we're bringing you into the park very directly, very straightforward, and then it begins to meander when you get on the inside. The meandering is combined with the creation of landforms and planting. So if the site was flat and the paths were as curving as this is suggesting they would be, you might say, well, people are never going to stay on the paths. They're just going to cut off the paths. But we're combining the curves in the paths with rises and falls in the topography. So you're kind of going around landform or being held at the edge of it, and we're modulating movement to go up and down. Everything, um, Scott, correct me, but I don't think except at the one entry at Lakeshore, there are paths uh, anywhere in the design. We're all wheelchair accessible. Correct. Which means paths do not exceed a vertical rise of one foot vertical in 20 feet horizontal. So, I don't know, Scott and I are probably about 20 feet apart. And if you think the beginning of a path is where I am, and Scott held his hand off the ground just one foot up, that gives you a sense of how gentle the paths are. And that's another reason why there is the curvilinear nature of the paths. Because sometimes, to get up to the hills that we're creating, we're taking those paths and we're meandering them up so that everybody I mean, when we talk about ADA access, we're not just talking about people in wheelchairs. We're talking about older population, uh, and not even older population, just people with disabilities who may be walking, but who can only navigate um, slightly steep inclines. So this is our Brooklyn Bridge Park on the left.